All right, thanks, John. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Not quite as many of you as there was on Easter Sunday, um, but good to see everyone and um, just thankful to be able to be together. You know, it's good to, to be together, gather together, to worship God together and, um, and be the church. So we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Um, last week, we did uh, take a, a little break from our series. If you're new here, uh, we go through books of the Bible, and we do series walking through books of the Bible. We're going through the book of Ephesians um, right now, and the title of the series is The Death of Our Divisions. And, and we took a, a little break last week as we just talked about the resurrection. But um, <clears throat> So since we took a week off, I'm going to give you a little bit of background for context of the passage that we're going to be uh, talking about today. So the book of Ephesians, Paul is writing, uh, Paul's apostle of, of Jesus. He is writing from prison. He is writing to believers in the city called Ephesus. And, and many of them who came to faith in Jesus were, um, were, I guess, pagans, you would call them. They, some of them were even into sorcery and things like that. We read that in the early chapters, how they came to a place of faith, their lives were radically changed. And so now Paul is writing to encourage them and to challenge them. And so the first three chapters uh, that we've read, we're actually in chapter four today, but the first three chapters, Paul spends a lot of time talking about what God has done, all the blessings that they have and that we have in Christ, who we are in Christ, all that God has done for us, okay? At the end of chapter three, he says, you know, now knowing who we are, all that God's done, the, the, the desire that God has for us to represent him in this world as a church, he goes, for this reason, I fall to my knees and pray, and I pray that you understand how deep and wide the love of Jesus is, that you would really understand the depth of his love for you so that you would be able to show that love to other people, okay? He also, in chapter 3, emphasized how through the death of Christ, through Jesus coming, dying on the cross, God has put to death the division that once was among people. And in their time in particular, it was the division of, of Jews and Gentiles. And so now, he says, now this mystery has been revealed, which is that God is inviting everyone into this relationship. It's not about God's chosen people being Israel and the Jews. It's about God's people who Jesus died for, that whoever would believe in him would come not only to a place of saving faith, but become a part of God's family, receiving all the blessings that are available. So now it's for Jews, it's Gentiles, it's everyone, okay? So that's chapter three, and it leads us into chapter four. So he says the church now, these people who have these divisions broken down, people from different backgrounds, different cultures, this is his church, and he calls it the new humanity. He goes, um, now he's taken the two, Jew, Gentile, he's made them one, there's no division. He calls it this new humanity. It is this beautiful thing called the church that God puts on display to this world to show the love of Jesus to people from all different walks of life, okay? So the church is supposed to be the most loving, compassionate, forgiving people, okay? It's not a place, it's not an organization, it's a people. And the church should be put on display for all to see, and it should be something attractive. Well, if we're going to be honest, the church has not done the greatest job in this area, all right? I mean, and I think it's important for us to be honest about how the church has done. You know, I don't know if you guys, if you are online at all, probably over the last couple of weeks, if you just check any of the news sites and things like that, there was a, um, a number of articles that circulated that all stemmed from a recent Gallup poll, okay? And I'm gonna just share a little uh, quote from it. And the whole thing was about how people are now shying away from uh, connecting with uh, a church or a place of worship. And, and this, was, this was actually about all religions, but listen, listen to this quote, and it'll come on the screen. Americans' membership in houses of worship continued to decline last year, dropping below 50% for the first time in Gallup's eight-decade trend. 
In 2020, 47% of Americans said they belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque, down from 50% in 2018 and 70% in 1999. So we've just seen this steady decline. Now this is, when they say all houses of worship, they're talking about, you know, they're talking about uh, mosques, synagogues. If you're just talking about Christianity, people who would say they attend a Christian church, in our area, okay, and we're in the South, right? In our area, uh, on a regular basis, it's less than 20%, probably closer to 15% people who regularly attend a place of worship, all right? So just think about that. These are real numbers, and I would say there's a real problem. You know, the, the church hits the headlines for all the wrong reasons, right? And we all see it. And then we have to talk to people about that, and we have to deal with it. But we can do one of two things. We can sit and complain about it, or we can try to make a difference. And I hope that here at Emmaus, and I hope for all of us, our desire is to make a difference. Our desire is to be this thing that Jesus talked about um, and that Paul emphasized in, in Ephesians chapter 3 when he said God makes his manifold wisdom, he puts it on display, his, his multi-sided wisdom he puts on display through this thing called the church where he shows his love and his grace to the world and it's supposed to be this beautiful beautiful thing well that church again it's not an organization it's you it's me it's everybody in this room who would say they follow jesus we're supposed to be salt and light in this world it's one of the reasons why we take the great commission seriously to go and and share the love of jesus with anyone who will listen. And the great commandment to love God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. These are the things that were most important to Jesus and they should be at the center of who we are as a church. So Paul, he knows all this and that's why in chapter three, he's like, I fall to my knees and pray that you guys understand this. And I who God is, all he's done for you, the blessings you have in Jesus. Now he goes, all right, enough of the doctrine now let's talk about our duty as believers. As a result of all of this stuff, how are we to live? How are we to show this world this beautiful thing called the church? So Ephesians 4, chapter 1, we're just going to go through uh, <clears throat> seven verses this morning. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Let's pray. God, I pray that as we take some time here to look at your word, that you would speak to our hearts. God, remind us of the life you've called us to live. Remind us of the opportunity and the obligation we have to live for you, that we would represent you well in this world. Lord, that people would see a church that's compelling because it's filled with your love and your grace. So God, speak to us now by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Paul starts off and he says, okay, uh, remember, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. So he's actually in prison as he's writing this. So he's got a little clout, okay? He is going through persecution, all right? So he is walking through a, a difficult time. And so he's writing to um, believers and he's saying, okay, in all circumstances, whatever you face, Okay, this is what you're supposed to do. And, and remember, I'm kind of going through it, all right? So he's a prisoner for the Lord. He suffered for his faith. And he says this. He says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. Listen, Paul is writing to Christians. He's not writing to pastors. He's not writing to apostles. He's writing to Christians, people who would say they're following Jesus. He's writing to people like you, and like me, all right? And he says, I beg you to live a life worthy of your calling. So if you say you're a follower of Jesus, you have a calling in him, 
All right, and so he's, he's saying, now listen, you've been called by God and there's a way that you're to live. He's called you into a relationship with himself and you're called to represent him to the world. It's part of what we're supposed to do as the church. We're Christ's ambassadors, Paul writes in another, uh, another passage. He says, we're to represent him to the world. What is, that's what an ambassador does, right? We talk about being his hands and feet in the world. So we are to represent Jesus, and to represent Jesus well, that means we need to follow Jesus, all right? Look at verse 2. All right, I beg you, I beg you to live a life worthy of your calling. This is, this is what it looks like. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. All right, so the first thing he says, sometimes... When it's convenient, express humility. That's not what he says, right? What does he say? Say the word with me. Always. Always be humble and gentle. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This, is, this one verse is one of the most challenging verses. Always be humble and always be gentle. You know, we've talked about this before. The Bible is really clear God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. He says it numerous times in the New Testament. I've talked about it recently. I don't, I don't think I have to continue to emphasize this, but when you are proud, you basically stand in opposition to God. Now, I don't, I don't know why anybody would want to do that. I think we do that without thinking about it. I mean, it's the epitome of fighting a losing battle. If you're opposed to God, you're on the losing team. Let me just say that, right? God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 6, you've heard about the seven deadly sins. One of them is pride, right? Now, here's the thing. A lot of people confuse this. There's, there's a difference between feeling good about your accomplishments or someone else's accomplishments, like having pride in that or being proud of somebody. There's a difference in that and in taking credit in such a way that it elevates you or elevates that person, okay? And so that's what he's talking about here. You know, a, a pride that would put me up on a pedestal or even, you know, someone else up on a pedestal above other people or taking credit for something that we've done. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes this, all right? For what gives you the right to make such judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given to you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? All right, so just, just to understand, okay, if you have some great accomplishments, something happens, um, you know, it's okay to feel good about that, but you just have to have a proper understanding of life and the way things work. The fact that you had the ability to do whatever it is that you did to accomplish whatever you accomplished it's a gift from God. Therefore, we point back to him because it's by his grace that we're able to do it, right? The fact that you can accomplish something by the work of your hands, first of all, happens because your hands work. <laughs> and the fact that your hands work is a gift from God. You know, John just highlighted um, the, the ministry special touch. And there's a lot of people with special needs that don't have just some of the very blessings that we have of just being able to function, you know, and not be in a wheelchair or, you know, some of those struggles that many people had. We take some of that for granted. And he goes, listen, understand, it's all a gift. And so don't take pride personally in these things. You know, yes, God works in and through us, but it's by his grace and it's a gift of God that we have the ability to, to do it. So if we take credit for it and we put ourselves in some place of unhealthy superiority, then we're in trouble. And in those moments, we find ourselves opposed to God. So Paul goes, listen, always be humble and gentle. Now, okay, if you got the humility thing under control, try this one out for size. Always be gentle. Are you always gentle? Listen, I'm an Italian guy Grew up in an Italian family, and I'm going to tell you, it was far from gentle most of the time. 
I mean, my mom had a temper, you know, we just experienced it. It was a part of life. Anybody have that, you know, like anyone have those experiences? I see some people looking at the person next to them and, uh, you know, like, I mean, always be gentle? Come on. I mean, can he really be serious about that? I mean, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, for me, if I'm going to be honest, that's really difficult. When someone annoys you, when someone wrongs you, be gentle. I mean, why would he say that? Well, we are supposed to be followers of Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we're supposed to represent Jesus, which means our lives should look like Jesus, which when you think about Jesus, he was humble and he was gentle. Now, there was times when he was firm, particularly with the religious leaders, you know, um, and you got to square that with what Paul's saying here, because I don't know if you could really, I don't know how you describe gentleness in the moment when Jesus goes to the temple and chases out the money changers. I mean, this is Jesus. He's got a whip and he's, he's flipping over tables, right? And so you go, okay, so what exactly is he talking about? Always be gentle. In our dealings with people, all right? especially people who we have an opportunity to impact for the Lord, people who don't know God. Always be humble. Always be gentle. Sometimes people in the church, you might need to be a little more firm with those people. You know why? Because they know better or they should know better. And so when Jesus goes and he starts flipping over tables, it's because these are the people who are supposed to be representing God and they've turned the thing around because you've turned this into a den of robbers. And so he gets real serious real fast. So if you want to have an excuse for your non-gentle moments, (laughs) let it be in those moments when the church isn't being what the church is supposed to be and we need to stand up and say, hey, listen, that's not right. But when it comes to people who you deal with just in everyday life, the people who wrong you, the people who really just, you know, cause the hair on the back of your neck to stand up, that's when you need to express humility. That's when you need to express a gentleness And that's when, if we're going to be honest, that's when we all need Jesus, right? Because I can't do that on my own. You can't do that on your own. We need the Holy Spirit to help us do that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, those are all fruits of the Spirit. Paul talks about it in Galatians 5, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So if you struggle to be humble or if you struggle to be gentle, what you need is not more of your own willpower. What you need is more of the Holy Spirit. What we need to do in those moments is surrender to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit, right? We're in Florida. Oranges, some people, apples, whatever it might be, are abundant. But orange trees produce what? Oranges, right? How hard does an orange tree have to work to produce an orange? Not very hard. You know, I've said before, when was the last time you saw an orange tree going, you know, trying to produce that orange? No, it just happens, right? So it should be a new bumper sticker. Fruit happens, okay? It just happens because it's, a, it's an orange tree. So if the Holy Spirit's living in you, it should produce this fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. So you don't need more willpower. You don't need to try harder. What we need to do is we need to surrender more to him. I need more of Jesus. I need more of the Holy Spirit. If I need to be more gentle, I need to be more humble. I need more of the Holy Spirit. I need to surrender to the Holy Spirit's work in my life. So Ephesians 2, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Now, imagine what it would be like if we lived this way. Imagine what it would be like if if most of us lived humble, gentle lives, regardless of the circumstance. If someone wrongs us, we're patient, we're understanding, we forgive, we make allowance for each other's faults. I mean, imagine what it would look like. I mean, it'd be incredible, right? It'd be amazing. It'd be beautiful. There would be a, a unity that is rarely seen in the world. 
And it's not the kind of thing that we see happening outside the church. And if we're going to be honest, it's really not the kind of thing we see too often within the church. But I would say if this was happening, if the people of God were humble, gentle, loving, made allowance for each other's faults, accepted one another, if that was happening on the regular, people on the outside would be intrigued. They'd be like, what is going on over there? What is up with those people? I think they'd be compelled to want to find out more. And that's exactly what happened when Jesus walked the earth. I mean, the people who seemed to be farthest from God, were, they were like magnets to Jesus. They, they just continued to follow Jesus. Even when Jesus pointed out their sin and their faults. Think about the woman at the well. Okay, so there's a story where Jesus goes and he's at this well and there's a woman there. He shouldn't even be talking to her according to Jewish culture, but he does. And she is a woman who, as the scripture tells us, has had many men. And Jesus spends time with her. And Jesus reaches her heart in a way that like only Jesus can. It's, I said this to someone recently, I'll probably get myself in trouble here. Um, but Jesus said in the only way that, that Jesus, you know, that Jesus could, like um, the kindest way to tell her basically about her lifestyle of, of having many men, and you can choose many words to associate with that, but um, her loose lifestyle, he points it out, right, to her, and, and she is compelled by that. Okay, when he's trying to reach her heart, she's like, man, he goes, if you would just know who you were talking to, you know, he asked her for a cup of water and and she goes, you shouldn't really ask me for a cup of water. He goes, but if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. And she goes, I want some of that water. And he goes, oh, okay, well, uh, go get your husband and come back. Jesus, man, he's got the wisdom. He's like, he, he knows how to go right for the heart. Go get your husband. She's like, well, I don't have a husband. He's like, yeah, that's right. Hey, you know, the one you're with is not your husband, and neither were the four or five before that, right? So he's, he's like the kindest way of telling someone that, you know, they're a whatever, okay? I don't want to use the word, but like, you know, he, he can say to somebody like that, like, you're living a sinful, loose lifestyle, and you know what she did? She goes back to the city, and she tells everyone about this guy, Jesus. Like, he just pointed out her sin. And she's like, you need to come and hear the guy who told me everything about me. And and so in his love for her, even in a difficult moment where he wanted to reach her heart and point out her sin so that she would change, she is compelled to that. Was he patient? Was he gentle? Was he humble? There was a lot. He's, this is God in the flesh. There's a lot of things he could have said to her in that moment, right? There's a lot of things he could have done to confront her sin, but he does it in a way that's so compelling that she responds and she goes to tell other people. See, I think this is where the church, this is where we're failing. We, we'd rather tell people just how wrong they are and we want to tell them forcefully and we want to make sure that they understand. And they've got to understand truth. And, and sometimes we just beat them over the head with truth. But where's the love? Where's the compassion? Where's the gentleness? Where's the humility? Where's Jesus in that? And what Paul is saying, remember, he started this off and goes, I beg you, I beg you to live this way. Why? Because it represents Jesus well. And when the church is representing Jesus well, People will be compelled even in those moments where we have to stand on truth, but we do it with love and grace, and they're like, okay, I get it, because they realize that what we're sharing with them is the best possible way to live, and we're sharing with with them because we love them and we care about them, and we don't want to see them harm themselves, and we don't want to see them ultimately be separated from God. A lot of it has to do with our posture. A lot of it has to do with the Holy Spirit working in and through us. Always be humble. Always be gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. But he doesn't end there. Look at verses 3 and 4. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body, one Spirit, just as you've been called, to one glorious hope 
for the future. Make every effort to keep yourselves united. Okay? He doesn't say, he doesn't say make every effort to, to be united, make every effort to produce unity. He says make every effort to keep yourself united. As the people of God, unity is already there. If you've come into a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. You are, uh, the scripture says, born again. You're adopted into God's family. You're a new creation in Christ. You are a child of God. I am a child of God. That means we are brothers. We are sisters. We are unified in that. We have the same spirit. The unity is there. So Paul goes, make every effort to keep the unity. All you got to do is keep it. God's already given it to you. And so we got to fight to keep that unity. And there's so many divisions in the church. I mean, I don't think I'm going out on a limb here to say, you know, it's not God's plan. It was never God's plan for there to be a hundred different denominations in the church. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. How many churches are there? One. There's one church. But it's splintered and divided. Why? Because we've done a horrible job at keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We're to keep unity, not create division. And we divide over the craziest things. We divide over doctrine. We divide over things that really, in the end, don't matter much. Do you believe in predestination, free will? You know, people feel so strongly about those things. We end up dividing on those things. You know what's really ironic is when we divide over things like doctrine, like what your view of baptism and things like that, to the point where if someone doesn't believe what we believe, we go, man, that person's a heretic, right? You know, that person's a heretic. They don't believe truth. You know what's really ironic? In the early church, if you go back to like the first and second century, the thing that they called heresy, heresy was reserved, and that word was used for people or groups of people who brought the vision in the church. People who brought the vision in the church were called heretics. And now that term has kind of been used for people who um, come with an, an unorthodox view of Scripture or something. We call them heretics, you know, because of their doctrine. But if you take the early church's stand on that, Someone who stands so strongly for their doctrine, whatever it might be. I'm just taking free will, predestination, whatever side you're on. You know, hopefully you're somewhere in the middle or whatever, wherever you are, okay? But whoever takes such a strong stand on that to the point where they'd go, you know, if they don't believe my way, I mean, you know, it's heresy or whatever. In the early church, that person, even if they were right, would have been a heretic, because they were bringing division to the body where there shouldn't have been division. I mean, just think about that. That's how important this is. Paul goes, make every effort to be united in the Spirit. Keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, what I'm not saying is we don't try to stay um, orthodox in our belief in the Scripture. But we don't divide over those things. And we've divided over so many different things. And you go from one denomination to another. And, and a lot of times it's so close. And then there's just one little thing. Oh, but we believe this. And we're right. Newsflash. The Baptists don't get their own little room up in heaven. The Methodists don't get their own space in heaven. The non-denominational people like us, we don't get our own little space in heaven. There's one body, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, and we are to be one people united in Jesus. And so we need to find a way to get along. How does that happen? By the power of the Spirit. So it doesn't surprise me that less than 50% of people attend a place of worship or less than 20% of people attend a Christian place of worship because a lot of times they look and go, man, those people really aren't that much different than me. But when they looked at Jesus, man, they saw someone different. They saw something different. And Paul, I think, is challenging us, and we need to all hear this, to live more like Jesus. Jesus' invitation was not, come to me to be saved. Certainly, salvation was involved in his invitation, but that wasn't really his invitation. His invitation was always, 
come and follow me. Come follow me. And when you follow him and when you believe in him and put your faith in him, yes, you're saved, you're born again, all these things change. But you have to follow him. And I think that the church, we've done a poor job of really following him in so many different areas and so many different, you know, when it, when it comes to just how the church even functions a lot of times. But again, we can sit here and complain about it or we can do the one thing that makes a difference. And that is people like you, people like me, all of us saying, I'm going to do my best with the power of the Holy Spirit to live more like Jesus because the world needs Jesus. People out there need Jesus. And we need Jesus to help us live in a way that represents him well. So, verses 5 to 7, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and in all, living through all. However, he's given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. All right, so Paul's stressing the unity that we have. He is saying there's one Lord, one baptism, one faith. There's one body, right? We should be one. And in order for that to happen, we need to be humble. We need to be gentle. We need to forgive one another. We need to be willing to overlook each other's faults. And this same God who's over all things is the God who, it says, is in all and living through all. Just think about that for a minute. Okay, look at that passage. Look at verse 6. One God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. So the way God communicates his love to people, the way God reaches people today is he lives in you and he reaches through you. So he uses you and he uses me to share his love with people. Now, I mean, that is really cool, but it's kind of crazy to think about that. Jesus is the hope of the world, but Jesus has left his church here to represent him. And so that hope comes through us as we share the good news of the gospel with other people. We can hinder God's work. We can hinder God's work through us. How do we do it? By not living the way that Paul begs us to live. So he wrote something similar in the book of Philippians, and we're going to wrap up here in just a, just a moment. Philippians 2, verses 3 to 8. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Sounds like pride, right? Be humble. Thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, but take interests in others too. Verse 5. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Okay? This is the attitude that we're supposed to have. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. So he was God and is God. He existed in the beginning, but he did not think of that equality with God as something to hold on to. He was willing to release his position in heaven for our sake. And look at what it says. Though he was God, he did not consider equality with God something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Levi, you guys can come back up. See, Paul says you have to have the same attitude of Jesus. When you have the same attitude of Jesus, then the life of Jesus flows in you, through you, and reaches out to the world around you. And what does it mean to have the same attitude of Jesus? Well, this is like the perfect picture of humility. God Almighty, God who created everything, steps out of heaven, comes to earth, walks this sin-stained planet out of his love for mankind, out of his love for the people he created, out of his love for the people who turned their backs on him, out of his love for the people who would ultimately beat him, have him arrested, crucified. This is the humility that we're called to have. He says, have the same attitude of Jesus. 
Now, Ephesians 4, 7, and I'm going to wrap up with this. All right? However, he has given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. This is how Paul kind of wraps up this thought. He has given each one of us a special gift. You've been gifted by God in some way. You have a spiritual gift, so to speak. Something that God wants to use in order for you to better share his love with people. You have gifts, you have talents, and God wants to use those to share his love with people. And here's where the whole thing with humility, I think, comes in. You might be gifted in such a way that you're really good at what you do. That gives you opportunity, that gives you influence to share the love of God with people. Don't think that that's just the natural thing that you do and you do it well. Remember, you do it well because God's gifted you to do it well. And you do it well for a reason beyond just the accomplishments that you experience here and now. He's gifted you so that you can point back to him and share his love with people. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I want to pray for us. And I want you to think about this for a moment. If you would, just... Just close your eyes just in an attitude of prayer. He's given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Through his generosity, he has blessed you. And I want you to think about what are your gifts? In what ways are you gifted? Are you using those gifts for him? What unique talent do you have? How can you use that to point people to Jesus? Have you found success? Are you remaining humble? If you find success in what you do, how will you handle that? And all of our gifts are different. God, thank you. Thank you that you use each one of us or you desire to use each one of us. But we confess we need your help. It's not easy to remain humble. It's not easy to be gentle. We're tempted in so many ways in this world. We're told over and over again that life is really about us. It's about our desires. It's about our accomplishments. Look out for us. But God, your word just comes against that and tells us that we should put the, the need of others before us, that we should consider others above us, that we should love others in such a way that we would willingly give of what we have to be a blessing to them. God, help us to have that humility. Help us to have that same attitude that you had when you walked, walked this world, Lord. Holy Spirit, work in us and through us as only you can. I pray that you would remind us of all the blessings that we have and the blessing that it is to be used by you to share your love with this world. And as we sing this last song, let's be reminded of that. What you've done and what you've called us to, help us to keep that unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, being willing to love our brothers and sisters, even in spite of our differences, so that you might get the glory, so that people might look at the church and see this beautiful thing that you came to create to represent you in this world. God, we thank you for the opportunity. We ask for your help. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Let's sing this last song together, and I think you'll see how it relates to what we're talking about. Let it be an act of worship for you.